six minutes after the hour. Welcome everyone. Um, no formal structure today. OB stackers out of town. Um, looks like a light crew. So um, I would love for anyone who hasn't yet to introduce themselves and uh, speak what's on their mind. I love learning about new community members. And you can uh, raise your hand to speak. I can uh, get you on stage. Yeah, let's just get everyone on stage here. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Welcome, welcome. Hi, I can introduce myself. Is that Mark? Yeah. Great. Welcome, Mark. And, uh, thank you so much. I know I'm supposed to be speaking later, but I'm I'm Mark Lawrence. I'm actually originally from the UK, um, but I've been living in the US for a large number of years. And back in October, I joined the Bankless DAO and was really fascinated um, by um, the structure of the DAO and how it's so different to a typical hierarchical organizational structure and the benefits that come out of that. And, but probably back in 2017, I was introduced to Bitcoin, um, but I wasn't really that fascinated with Bitcoin. But as soon as I saw the blockchain, I immediately thought this is going to change the world because I spend a lot of time in corporate America using technologies to enable these businesses to become more efficient to offer um, better business products and services to their clients. So I was always familiar with taking these technologies and coming up with interesting use cases, but for corporations. And once I saw the blockchain, I could, I could immediately see that a lot of the problems, the technical problems that existed in these Fortune 500 companies could be revolutionized by that. And so first of all, Discovering the blockchain was a huge turning point for me. And then secondly, joining the Bankless DAO and seeing how this new structure um, can use human resources in a very, very different way. I think that combination is fascinating. And, and now for me, Web3, where you can basically have a point-to-point -point value exchange and eliminate intermediaries in the middle, I think that is going to come dramatically change in a lot of industries as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And, uh, it's hard not to see the application with everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, Mark, did you want to talk about your, uh, project proposal? Yeah. Uh, so has everybody else introduced themselves or should I just go ahead and, and go through it? Well, while you have the floor, uh, take it away. We'd love to hear. Okay. Let me figure out how I can actually share my screen. What I have here. Am I able to share my screen? I don't see an option to share my screen. Um, I'm wondering if the stage format doesn't allow for that. Let me see. I, I don't think the stage format allows for it. I think you can do it only in like a regular, you have to have the capability to like show video and all the other stuff too. Uh, let's, let's all hop in the lounge. That should be pretty easy. Then, then you should be able to share. Okay. Does that work for everyone? Yep. It's just above the movement stage. Sounds good. All right. I'm going to switch over. Okay, so now it's saying I cannot stream into this channel. Hmm. Uh, let me see. There's some permissions.
Yeah, mine seems to work fine. Yeah, I think I just need permissions. I'm not sure where to do that. Um, one second. Mark, did you join a um, <clears throat> a channel? So, so did you oh. assign yourself a role in that you clicked something that designated you as a marketer, designer, etc.? Well, it's just changed. It's now allowing me to share. So let me try to share. Never Great. mind. There you Fantastic. Go. Are you able to see my screen now? Yep. Okay, so the, the problem that, we're, again, my name is Mark Lawrence. I'm working out of um, Bankless DAO and particularly Bankless Africa. And their goal, it's a huge goal, Bankless DAO is to onboard a billion people into crypto. Um, and obviously to do that, you're going to need a lot of people from other parts of the world and specifically Africa. And the, the, the problem that we're trying to solve is that... Um, is a, a, a climate finance concept called carbon offsets. And I'll, I'll get to that in the presentation. And for whatever reason, um, mature forests are not allowed to monetize their ability to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, carbon sequestration, using traditional carbon offsets. And, and there's a good reason for it. The, the policy was created in Europe and in the US where they believe that most mature forests are owned by the government or they're owned by large corporations. And so they don't need financial incentives to prevent deforestation. And that works well in Europe and the US, but it's absolutely disastrous in Africa where perhaps there's a forest that's owned by subsistence farmers and they actually do need financial incentives to prevent deforestation. And because they cannot monetize the trees or the forest on their land, what they actually do is participate in illegal logging. And they cut down trees on their own land or in their own community so they can convert forest land into farmland in order to feed their families. So this policy, which is called additionality, which is basically saying mature forests cannot sell carbon offsets, it makes sense in the US, it makes sense in Europe, but it has exactly the opposite of the intended impact or effect in, in Africa. And so I'm going to just quickly jump through some of these pages. And, and so the, the first question is, what is global warming? And so according to NASA, and, and can you see on, on my screen here there's like two charts one on the left and one on the right yep okay so the chart on the left this is from nasa it's indicating that since the start of the industrial revolution the amount of carbon dioxide methane greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has increased exponentially and on the right hand side it's showing that the average surface temperature on the earth has also increased as well and so nasa is showing that there's a correlation between the two and the concept is that greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, they allow sunlight to penetrate through to hit the Earth's surface. But when that energy is reflected by the Earth's surface, it's, it's reflected as, as lower frequency radiation. And that lower frequency radiation cannot penetrate through the same greenhouse gases that allowed it to enter the Earth's, Earth's atmosphere in the first place. And so, all that heat is captured, is trapped within, within the Earth's atmosphere, and that creates or actually leads to global warming. And according to NASA, the main causes of global warming are burning fossil fuels, so like the electricity companies burning fossil fuels to generate electricity, and cutting down carbon-absorbing forests, because forests are really good at removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so each of us has a carbon footprint, which I'm sure you're all aware of. 
and forests are really, and trees are really good at removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through, um, through photosynthesis, where sunlight and water and carbon dioxide all combine and then trees emit oxygen and then absorb carbon into the tree and into the biomass as well. And it also generates glucose. And so trees are really good at removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so what is a carbon offset? And so the state of California has what's called a cap and trade program. And so they look at the electricity company and they say, well, we can't just tell them to stop burning fossil fuels because none of us will have any electricity and that's not gonna be very good. So instead of doing that, they say, let's incentivize them to remove, to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that they're emitting into the atmosphere. And so the state of California says to the electricity company, you have a cap. Every year, there's a certain amount of carbon dioxide that you can emit into the atmosphere. And then every year, we're going to reduce the cap. And if you go over your cap, then we're going to fine you. If you don't want to be fined, and you've said you've gone over your cap by 100 tons of carbon dioxide, you can go and trade with somebody who's removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or the avoidance of pumping carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is called a carbon offset. And so every year, if the electricity company in, the, in California is going to exceed their cap, and they can buy carbon offsets from a forest owner or somebody who's got some type of a you know a wind farm they can buy carbon offsets to offset their excess and so that's a carbon credit or allowance is your your permit to emit and then the carbon offset is a way to offset your excess now, there's two types of carbon offsets. There's compliance carbon offsets and voluntary. And so with a mandatory scheme like the cap and trade program in California, the electricity company is only allowed to buy carbon offsets from a regulated exchange. And there's other jurisdictions that have similar um, cap and trade programs in Europe, very popular in other parts of the world. There's also voluntary carbon offsets. So companies like Toyota and Amazon, they say, we're not working under a cap and trade program, but we just want to volunteer. We're good corporate citizens. We want to volunteer to be carbon neutral. So anybody can buy and sell voluntary carbon offsets. But there's these third party certification organizations out there that, that um, get brought into this program to certify that what these people are saying who are selling these carbon offsets are true. Now, to set up one of those programs for certification, it could easily cost $700,000 or more. And again, if you look at these low-income forest communities in Africa and other emerging economies, first of all, if they've got a mature forest, they're excluded from selling carbon offsets. Even if they were included, they couldn't afford the $700,000 to become certified. And so, they're completely excluded. And so, again, our goal is equity and inclusion in climate finance. Um, but, you know, back to the traditional carbon offsets, their goal is to incentivize new carbon sequestration, which excludes mature forests because their carbon sequestration is not additional. And on top of that, their certification costs are unaffordable. And we looked at this and we're actually working with a mature forest community in the Volta region of Ghana. And we felt that what we needed to do was come up with a whole new way to solve this age old problem. And our goal was equity and inclusion in climate finance, where mature forests are included and certification costs are driven down to zero dollars. And so how do you get how do you certify a forest for zero dollars? The way we do it is we use satellite technology and Web3 technology as well. And so there's a third party organization called Global Forest Watch. They're like, we use them as a third party oracle. They monitor every forest all around the globe. And in monitoring these forests, they use satellite imagery to look at the tree cover and machine learning and artificial intelligence to estimate the, the net carbon sequestration, i.e. the amount of carbon dioxide that's being removed from the atmosphere 
by a forest. And so now you don't need to, to pay, you know, expensive consultants to fly out from Norway with tape measures to measure the size of, of the tree trunks, which is an indication of how much carbon has been sequestered into the tree. And so this is using modern technology that wasn't available when these carbon offset programs were created 20 years ago, when they were, were created. And so what we have done is we've created a satellite navigation application that has an API that taps into their, their website and get, gathers their data so that we can see how much carbon um, di carbon dioxide is being extracted from the atmosphere by our forest in Ghana. And then on top of that, we use a blockchain, in this case, it's the Polygon blockchain, to track our NFTs. And each NFT is linked to a hectare within our forest. So what we have is we've got a forest at 66,000 hectares. One hectare is about two and a half um, acres. And we've subdivided our forest into one hectare blocks. And then what we've done is for each of those one hectare blocks, we've calculated the carbon sequestration using satellite imagery, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. And then when somebody buys one of our NFTs, we link that NFT to one of those hectare blocks. And the owner of the NFT owns the virtual rights to that hectare of land. They don't own the physical rights to the land or the trees. That's still owned by the landowner. But the real world carbon sequestration is part of the rights to that are convened, conveyed with the NFT. And also the owner of the NFT can use the virtual rights or digital rights of that one hectare of land in gaming and, and metaverse applications as well. And when we went to visit the forest, we actually took a, a FINRA SEC registered broker dealer and they actually assess the forest. Does the forest really exist? Do these people who own the forest really own the forest? And then met with the Forestry Commission, which is really the government, to um, get you know the government's opinion as to are these the real owners of the forest? Does the forest really exist? And do they have the rights to sell the, the carbon sequestration? And so the third party verification was done by a broker dealer. And if you look on the left hand side of this chart here, you can actually see the outline of our forest in the Global Forest Watch database. So what we did is we actually had people on motorcycles go around the boundary of the forest and get the geolocation points. And once you've got that map of the forest, you can input that data into the Global Forest Watch database, and then they calculate the carbon sequestration, the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere for your forest. And then we took it to the next level. We've got a, a Stanford educated data scientist, and then he subdivided our forest into one hectare blocks and used the same data to calculate the carbon sequestration for each hectare block within our forest. And so this table on the right is showing an example of it, where it's showing for hectare number one, what the longitude and latitude is, how many carbon offsets or digital or, or Web3 carbon offsets are associated with that one hectare block. The other thing that we have done is we've geolocated sites of interest within our forest. And so there's waterfalls and there's caves and there's a monkey sanctuary. And once we get the geolocation of those sites of interest, we can figure out whether they're actually on or close to a particular hectare that's associated with an NFT. And what that means is that those NFTs can now have physical rarity. Today, when people buy an NFT, they say, you know, do they have some rare aspect to the art? You know, maybe there's some art that's got shirts and maybe the green color shirt is very rare. And so they've got special rarity. Our NFTs actually have physical rarity because that NFT may be linked to a hectare of land that is close to a waterfall. And, and so we've got a satellite navigation app that we've built that's actually on our website. So you can go to our website and you can play with a satellite navigation app. And supposing, for example, you buy NFT number 1,222, you can input that number into our satellite navigation app, and then it will then navigate to the forest and then zoom in on that particular hectare of land. So you can see your hectare of land 
and you can see the carbon sequestration associated with that particular hectare of land. And so now what that does is it gives enhanced provenance and transparency that you don't get with traditional carbon offsets. And it also gives this rarity as aspect that's linked back to the NFT. And of course, the carbon sequestration or the carbon offsets are additional utility rather than just having a JPEG or getting a JPEG when you buy an NFT. And so this chart here is just showing um, that we've got 66,000 hectares of land. And if you look at 20,000 hectares, on average, they have more that each of them have on average six carbon offsets or more. And so we're advertising five carbon offsets per hectare per NFT. And in reality, everyone will get more than five. They'll probably get six, seven or eight. And so, again, when you buy, when somebody buys an NFT, they get the digital and virtual rights of one hectare of land, but they don't get the physical rights to the trees or the land itself. And then um, our price is $500 per carbon, per NFT. And that is $10 per carbon offset, which is the, which is the typical price of a carbon offset. Five carbon offsets per NFT, which is $50. And then you get the carbon offsets for 10 years. So it's 10 times five, which is 50 times 10 years, which is $500. And then what we do is we take 65% of the proceeds of the sale. Because remember, what we're doing is we're cutting out the middle people. And so the money that would have gone to these intermediaries, we can now take 65% of the revenue and then reinvest it back into that low income community. And we give 15% in this case to the traditional council. So the paramount chief who makes this communal decisions for this community that owns this forest, and they can spend it the, the way they want for forest management, et cetera. But 50% of that we reinvest through what we call a social innovation studio, which is like a venture capital fund where we go to the local community and say, you know, what problems are you facing? They say, we've got unemployment and the other issues they have. Typically, they've got solutions to those problems as well. So we say, what are your solutions? And then what we do is we work with the local community with the problems they've identified and the solutions, and then work with our crypto community. And remember, we're working out of Bankless Africa, people that have a lot of um, crypto skills to say, can we use NFTs or stable coins or DAOs to reimagine solutions to these problems that are both sustainable and profitable to help the community build a company or solve that problem in a way that will encourage entrepreneurship, create jobs, and hopefully um, economic growth as well. And so the difference here is that we're actually trying to teach people to fish rather than just giving them fish. I'm just jumping through a couple of slides here. So these are some of the advantages. So again, our goal is equity and inclusion in climate finance. So we're including these mature forests who are excluded from tradi selling traditional carbon offsets. We're selling, we're raising money by selling NFTs. Those NFTs are more than art. The, the utility they have is that they're backed by carbon offsets. We've got enhanced provenance, transparency, rarity by linking them to um, rare sites within the forest. And we also have a social innovation studio where we reinvest 65% of the funds back into that local community. And when I, when I look at a traditional carbon offset, I see that as a web one type solution where everything is centralized in these intermediaries, information, value, stake, and everything is centralized in the intermediaries. Some people are tokenizing traditional carbon offsets, and I see that as a kind of a Web2 solution where maybe information is decentralized, but a lot of the value is still centralized in these intermediaries. What we're looking at is something that's more like a Web3 solution, where in our solution, each of these hectare blocks of land, these plots of forestry have historical carbon, like a traditional carbon offset, and we don't even value that in, into the price. But we have current carbon future, um, sequestration, whereas a traditional carbon offset is historical. Maybe the carbon, was, carbon dioxide was sequestered a year ago or two years ago. 
So that's yesterday's fight against global warming. We are effectively allowing these NFTs to maybe you know, to, to sponsor one hectare of live trees. So they're sequestering carbon today and tomorrow and next month and next year into the future. And we've got enhanced provenance, enhanced rarity, and potentially gaming and metaverse rights, as well as social innovation. And 65% of the value actually goes to the farmer or the owner of the land. And in the future, we will actually probably evolve into a marketplace where a farmer would be able to stake their land and a buyer would be able to come into the marketplace and buy the carbon sequestration rights directly from the farmer. And so now what you have is a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, which to me is the promise of Web3. And this is the art for our promotional. We've got an advertising or promotional NFT. This is the art for the NFT that actually conveys carbon sequestration. And so it isn't just a JPEG. What it is, is it's actually an avatar. And when you mint the NFT, you actually get a humanoid, which is a humanoid's body, and you can select an animal's head. So you might say, I want a humanoid body with an elephant's head. I want the elephant's head to be blue. I want a green shirt on. And so you select these attributes. And then once you've selected those attributes, then you actually mint the NFT. And then those attributes are locked into your wallet. So in terms of our roadmap, and so we've actually completed all the development work right now. So what we need at this point is marketing assistance to actually sell the NFTs. And so we're working with the Bankless DAO and through the Bankless DAO, we're reaching out to other DAOs who might be interested, who you know, have a humanitarian aspect to their mission, who would be interested in helping out this low-income community or helping out in terms of reducing global warming. And then we would give them minting spaces um, uh, for our NFT release. And then at some point in the future, we'll probably evolve to a marketplace where again, these owners of land will be able to stake their forestry into the marketplace and transact directly with buyers of carbon offsets. And maybe even in the future, um, there may be a way to have some sort of asset-backed stable coin. This is, this is a statement from Chainlink. What Chainlink does is they actually encourage this kind of disruption in industries where you've got a centralized intermediary that's doing something in a very manual way. And Chainlink believe, believes in data. So what will happen in the future is that we're getting our data from this third party oracle called Global Forest Watch. But NASA also generates that data. And in the future, other organizations will, will generate similar data. And what companies like Chainlink will do is they'll pull that information from four or five or six different oracles and they will compare that data and then generate a consensus for the industry. And so in the future, we'll probably end, we'll probably end up getting that data from a, a consolidator like Chainlink rather than directly from the source that we're working with today. And this is information about some of our team members. And that's the summary. So hopefully I didn't take up um, too much time. So I don't know whether that makes sense. There's a lot of information there. Yeah, we're really excited about it. And and there's multiple benefits, you know, on, on one hand, there's, you know, the fight against global warming. On the other hand, it's helping low income communities monetize an asset where they're excluded today. And then thirdly, um, we're actually helping them in terms of entrepreneurship and bringing expertise from the US and elsewhere. Um, and some of that will be Web3 expertise to basically reimagine solutions. Like, like we've used NFTs to reimagine um, the problem associated with climate finance today being exclusive. Yeah, that's some really important work. Do, do you have some um, 
Do you have some vision for how this how this can tie into movement, Dow? Yeah, and, and so we're actually reaching out to other DAOs um, to figure out um, ways that we can collaborate. And, and with other DAOs, what they're saying is we would like whitelist spaces. Um, and in, in some, they're actually giving us feedback in terms of different ways that um, we can work with them because it's it's really aligned with, with some of their missions. And so in this case, what I wanted to do was just present the information because we're not really looking for funding for the technology because we've already built the technology. At this point, it's supporting um, whatever marketing help may be available to either um, to help uh, market and sell um, the NFTs and whether there's some um, way that we can collaborate to actually share the benefit of doing that. Nice. I was wondering, do you have a link to that presentation somewhere? Because there's a lot of really good information. In yeah. There. Yeah. What I can do is um, it's, it's pretty big, so I, I'm not sure that I can sell it. But what I can do is upload it to Google Docs and I can um, send you the link to it and then you can just download it from there. Nice. OK. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, if you want to post that in the movement ideas section, that would be great. OK, will do. Yeah, bravo. Nice job on the presentation. And it seems like a very thoughtful project. So thank you. Important work. So we can open up the floor again. Uh, if anyone has anything to share today. I had a quick question for Mark Law 01. Um, Sorry, a little late on the question. Uh, what do you foresee as the biggest challenges? You highlighted some of the some of the areas for partnership and, and where uh, Movement DAO could support. But as you look uh, going forward in the space, what, what do you see as some of you know sort of the biggest potential hurdles and challenges that you face to gain this form entry? So yeah, the biggest challenge that I see is that uh, you know there's this concept of the diffusion of innovation. And so initially when a new technology comes along, it's the innovators who start off, then the early adopters. And then it's really difficult to get from the early adopters to the early majority. And then you get the, the late majority and then the laggards. And so there's a lot of organizations out there who will say, we will stick with the tradition. And so we will only buy carbon offsets if they're traditional carbon offsets and these third party certification companies have put their stamp on it. Now, when we speak to companies or organizations who are already a DAO or they're already into Web3, they look at this and say, yeah, this is the way the problem should be solved. And so they're more accepting of this type of a solution to that problem. And so the big challenge that I see is that the same challenge that any startup has is what's called crossing the chasm, getting from those early adopters to the early majority. And, you know, maybe when we look back in five or 10 years time, everybody will say the whole voluntary market is being handled in this way. And, you know, I don't know if it's going to be us or somebody else, but ultimately Web3 technology will be used for carbon offsetting in the future. It's just going to take some of these slower moving organizations a longer period of time to adopt. And because of that, that's why we're focused on Web3 type organizations and DAOs and organizations that, already, that are already mission aligned in terms of targeting them um, to join our cause early on. Thanks for sharing that. I think it's also, that's part of the challenge I think we're facing too, as we look to disrupt sort of the movement nonprofit charity space for how people start uh, these exciting ideas and applications for where, you know, Web3 could change the world. So um, would love to continue this conversation. I think it's one of the most exciting um, opportunities or scenarios I've seen with carbon offsets and um, fighting global climate change. So thank you, Mark. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, one, one thought, you know, we've been having is, um, I think we, just this Web3 concept of being radically uh, transparent and radically open and um, there's just a different psychology with Web3 and partnering with people and um, growing together. So, you know, we're building out this, you know, the vision for the platform is kind of this uh, global endowment concept using DeFi to uh, not only enable the creation of movements, but to continuously fund them in creative ways. Um, but one component of that, you know, we're, we've been having internal discussions about treasury management and just talking about doing things like token swaps or collaborating on marketing campaigns. Uh, Mark, you mentioned a, a whitelisting, you know, kind of structure, which makes a lot of sense. Um, but, you know, we, we want to have the treasury have a component of the treasury being safe and stable and low volatility and don't lose your money kind of a concept. We have a section that is more risky and stretching for yield and opportunistic with, um, you know, unique, um, assets within the market. And then there's a component that is finding other projects that are just completely aligned in ethos and vision and, um, and are just inspiring to our community. And, um, so we're just thinking through how, um, not only from an investment standpoint, but from an impact standpoint, how we utilize our treasury to um, access other completely different platforms, uh, potentially things that are on a completely different blockchain um, for the sole purpose of supporting projects and movements that are making real impact, so. Can I just make one more point? Where we've started that very discussion with the Bankless DAO because they're trying to do the same thing where they're trying to diversify their treasury as well. And so potentially, you know, potentially carbon offsets or NFTs related to carbon offsets may be a way to do that. And we also had a discussion with Cello that's a different blockchain. They were trying to get us to swap from, we're using the Polygon blockchain. And before we mint, Cello was trying to get us to switch to their blockchain. And they said that they have a reserve. And so they've got their own currency, but in their reserve, they've got a certain amount of Bitcoin and Ethereum, and they're actually putting carbon offsets in their reserve as well. And so today, um, their reserve is about 0.5% carbon offsets, and they expect to grow that to about 20%. And then that reserve is actually back in the currency. And so other people are talking about doing something similar in different ways, whether it's other DAOs and their treasuries, or people using um, mixed assets in some type of reserve that backs a currency. Absolutely. Um, why not have a social impact with, with your treasury? That's, um, yeah, we're, we're just thinking through how, um, how best to do that in a risk managed way, obviously, but, um, it's, it just seems like, uh, there's just so many, um, amazing projects out there and great opportunities to partner. So thanks for sharing that presentation. Yeah, the presentation was great. And then just um, just a suggestion, not that you're asking, but from a marketing perspective, I would I think it would be really valuable um, if you recorded yourself giving that presentation in like a loom 
um, because hearing your voice, um, you know, over the slides adds like a lot of um, meaning um, and understanding. And so I'm wondering if that I was looking on your website and looking over the white papers, but I learned so much more from hearing you speak that it might be helpful um, to sort of, you know, give people a bigger picture of what you're doing. Plus, you've got a great voice. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll, I'll, um, we should do that and then actually make that available on, on the landing page. Yeah, I think it'd be great. And I'd actually like to see it again because I've been kind of pulled in a few directions and I didn't, there were a few key points that I'd love to revisit. So, um, but again, I think the project's exciting and very interesting. Thank you for the advice. Of course. And then just a question on the treasury. I don't know if this is it. Like what, like, what is the, like, I know this is a really low yield market at the moment. I don't know what like yield in Web3 looks like, but what kind of like yield goals do we have in terms of actual percentages? And it's a great question. Um, you know, it kind of, uh, in a way, kind of mimics the um, stock and bond market, uh, right? Because there's kind of an opportunity cost there. Uh, so the strategy, what we've talked about is having roughly like 80% of the portfolio in very uh stable stable coin um yielding probably four to six hundred basis points um which is a little higher than bonds um but then of course if you as you go out the risk curve you can find things that are yielding 30 percent and you can find things that are absolutely insane yielding thousands of percent tens of thousands of percent right. um, so it's very much like a barbell approach where it's like you want to you know kind of using the 80 20 rule um you kind of want to spend 80 percent of your time on the 20 percent piece because that's where you're actually taking risk um and so given current market conditions, we're shooting for just under 10% yield um, with that primary uh, focus on capital preservation. Um, but then carving out a piece of that return seeking piece to, to say, okay, all things equal, is there an expected return with this potential project, you know, this carbon credits project, for example, mm -hmm. that's equivalent to this other risk seeking asset that can be part of our impact budget, so to speak. Um, and so that's where, um, you know, the kind of rationalization takes place, but, um, Early days, you know, our obviously our goal is to not f anything up. Mm -hmm. um, so we are we're really just taking a a pretty um, plain vanilla approach to the treasury management. Mm -hmm. But as we grow, um, you know, these things kind of scale differently as you have more assets, right? Um, right. So. And it actually scales in a way that's can become challenging because these assets are capacity constrained, these, these higher risk assets. So, um, the bigger you get, the more creative you have to get. But, um, I think that's where, you know, it's kind of a champagne problem when you have too much money and you can't deploy it. But, <laughs> But, but that means if, if we have that problem, that means the platform is doing well and therefore has a lot of influence. And mm -hmm. so in that scenario, partnering with, um, you know, a project like this is hugely beneficial for everyone. Um, so we hope to be in that spot at some point, but that's the general idea. I hope Got I it. answered the question. No, you did. So, I mean, basically, yeah, you did. So, so, and then just in summary, so basically like our funding pool is hoping to generate 
you know, a little under 10% annually to, to help fund projects. And then in order to get to that 10%, we'll be doing a mix of like stable yield and then working on then partnering with like more like new projects with lots of growth potential. Yep, exactly. Got it. Thank you. Anybody else? I have a hard stop here in eight minutes, but you guys are welcome to stay on. Hello, everybody. So I'm Benoit from uh, France, I'm currently in Paris. Um, I was very amazed by your presentation, Mark. Uh, I really feel like uh, uh, this is why I joined the Web3. Uh, to um, to hear such projects, which really make sense, uh, and which are enabled with this kind of uh, new technologies. Uh, I had a question concerning the uh, tokenomics of the NFT um, to understand whether uh, users and token holders would. Um, be able to get a profit from this NFT, or if it's more like something pro bono um, for a kind of donation with a, a, a metaverse possibility of usage of use case, but with um, I don't really understand how uh, in the in the future uh, this token uh, will can get some value. Yeah, and so in, in the US, we've got this organization called the SEC. And if you say that this NFT has some expectation of profit going forward, then that ends up being classified as a security. And so we cannot say anything like that. Um, but what we plan to do is have a community. And so these NFT buyers will be part of that community. And we're going to allow that community to vote on important decisions. And presumably that community will vote on decisions that is to the benefit of that community, whatever that may be in the future. But of course, we can't say anything today um, that may end up um, getting us into trouble with the SEC. All right, that's a bit foggy, but I, I can imagine. Uh, do you have any uh, leads on um, some ways to uh, make it um, something that can uh, as well finance the uh, preservation of forest and also give a profit to the token holders that so that it would be like completely perfect. I mean, uh, that that's really something uh, that could really uh, um, lead to a, a, a big adoption of this kind of system because it's 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 the first time I, I think about it this way, and uh, and I'm I'm really impressed. Uh, but still, I don't I I can't figure out how the token will take value um, if the community decide well, to make it um, exchangeable first or tradable. I, I believe this is the first step to make it, to, to give it a value, but then I, I don't see the next step to, to give an intrinsic value of, of, the, of the token. Yeah, and maybe I can answer the question this way. So remember, we said we reinvest 65% of the um, revenues back into the community and 50% of that is through a social innovation studio. That social innovation studio is like a venture capital fund. And so it's helping the local people solve their problems in a profitable way. And so it's funding small companies that will grow, whether it's an agricultural company or whether it's a technical company. And then some of that value will accrue back to that social innovation studio. 
And if there's a community that's managing that, maybe that community then has a vote and say, you know, this social innovation studio is growing in value. Why don't we vote to give ourselves some of that value? Yeah, but then it will be the end of the pro bono stuff. <laughs> because... Right. And, and again, so you can't say that up front. Um, but once everybody's bought their NFTs and it's a closed community, that closed community can make whatever decisions they want. Right. Yeah. Uh, so thank you again, Mark. That was a very good, uh, very good presentation. You're welcome. Uh, we started to introduce ourselves. Maybe, maybe I can go forward with my introduction. Um, yes, maybe, please do. Go. Yeah. yeah, so I'm in the ecosystem uh, since 2017. Before that, I was in the, um, I was in the um, sharing economy uh, ecosystem. We have developed a, a platform for car sharing. That's how I came to uh, to uh, to the blockchain, since the blockchain is a um, incredible way, new way to be able to share the value that is created through the collaborative economy. Uh, now I'm developing a, a, um, um, a community of IT talents uh, dedicated to Web3 through uh, a protocol. Uh, matching protocol with, that is uh, collaborative and decentralized. And we are organizing uh, a Web3 job fair uh, uh, during the ETC week in Paris that will take place in, uh, in July, between the 19th and the 22nd of July. Uh, and so we, our target is to, um, to get there 100 exhibitors and uh, 1.5 thousand uh, talents from across the world it will be uh, it will be uh, both it will be an, an hybrid event both uh, on site and online uh, and um, i would be really happy to to answer any question or anything about it and to to meet you there if you if you come to the hcc or if you if you want to to visit our event. Very cool. Yeah, that's very exciting. Do you have um a link or something that we can share um in our group with the rest of the community? I think there might be a lot of interest. Yes. Uh so for now we have um uh, Twitter account and um, and a website. The registration are not open yet, but it will be uh, soon open. I can I can share it. Uh, wh what do you want me to share it? Hello. I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that question. Would you say we should have it in um, announcements or in the lounge? I don't know. Oh, Fuego just, sorry, it dropped. Could be, um, you could drop it, if you wanted to drop something both in the introduction channel and in the general channel, perhaps. Um, yes. Yeah. Or if, and if, yeah. The announcement, an opportunity for, you know, for people in the Web3 community to find work. So it might not be related to us, but mm. I don't know if that's. Yeah, I can. Um, I think Rice Cracker is working on the um, newsletters. So if you post the link in the introductions or general, I can I can uh, point him towards that to put it in the newsletter. Great, great. Uh, also, one more thing is that uh, I received an airdrop uh, from uh, Ascended app. Uh, I was very uh, surprised and uh, happy to, to get it. 
And good. I want to thank you guys for it because I'm I'm quite happy with it. It is uh, good looking. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Congratulations. Welcome to the family. Thank you. Nice. Anybody, anybody else have anything they want to share before we close out this week's town hall? I'm good. Thank you. Cool. Well, it's been a pleasure. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day, night, or morning, wherever you happen to be. Thank you, everybody. Ciao.